Welcome to lesson number two, the Covenant Primer. Brian, welcome to our lesson and thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Renir, and welcome to our subscribers and viewers. Uh, may the Lord bless you as we go into this really beautiful study today. Amen. Please pray for us before we start. Sure. Loving Father, we thank you that we can come to you this afternoon. We know that you love us and you've established a covenant to save us. And that covenant is confirmed and ratified by the blood of your son, Jesus. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Bless us, each one, as we listen, as we study, as we read. May your spirit inspire us with new heights of love and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Our text this week is Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, we are going to look at the covenant basics. We're going to look at some of the covenants that God has made with some of the men in the Old Testament. And obviously, we'll probably delve into, it, into more detail as the quarter progresses. But this is basically an overview of these covenants that God has made with his people. So the covenant basics um, is very important to understand. Um, so firstly, God's covenant, it's interesting that he's always the one that initiates. He's always the one that takes the first step that I want to make this covenant mm -hmm. with you. And this covenant is always based upon a promise with an oath. So God gives the mm -hmm. promise. There's an oath then made between the two parties. The covenant is an agreement between two parties that agree upon the same thing. Then the second thing is that the person always needs to obey the rules of the covenant. You know, God's got no problem to obey the rules. He, the, the part of he, the, his side of the covenant that he needs to keep to is that he needs to bring the promises to pass. He needs to lead the events in such a way that the promise would actually take place. It would happen. But for the person, for the human side, is we need to obey the rules of the covenant, the obligations God has put out there. Obedience is key. We see it in the new covenant. The law of God is the foundation of the covenant. And then the third thing is that the covenant is actually then fulfilled in the life and death and resurrection of Christ, the plan of salvation. So these, these are the three steps, Brian, of a covenant. How do you understand the basics mm -hmm. of a covenant from your side, from your perspective? So the basic would be um, an agreement, a will. It's a wonderful um, uh, idea when you look at the covenant being a will because a will is the last testament that someone leaves to the benefactors. Mm. And we find that when Jesus died, his will, he made it very clear while he was alive, is that he has come to seek and to save the lost, mm -hmm. but he could not save them unless he died. I mean, on the cross, it's interesting. The devil used the scribes and the priests and the rabble to say, you know, if you be the king of Israel, come down from the cross and we will believe you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the only way that he could save mankind, they said, he, others he saved himself, he, can, he cannot save. And that was a, a profound truth. Jesus could only save people if he himself had died. So that was his last mm. testament. And he yes. sealed it with his blood. So I, I think about uh, another word for a covenant, basically a treaty. When you think about the, the great controversy, we, we're in a battle mm. between Christ and Satan, between good and evil. And we see Renier in our study that, that, that each covenant God made, whether it was with uh, Noah, whether it was with Abraham, with Moses, each covenant refers back or is foundational in the first covenant in Genesis 3.15, which we studied last mm -hmm. week. So, you know, the, the beauty about the covenant, uh, I'd like to add on to, you know, the, the fact that, as you said, you know, it's established by Christ's birth, his life, his obedience to God's will, his death and his resurrection. And, and, and equally important, his high priestly ministry in heaven, because, it is on the basis of his blood shed on Calvary mm. applied in the temple in heaven where sin is not only forgiven, 
but cleansed, removed from the sanctuary, finally in the atonement, uh, on the Day of Atonement for sure. Uh, that is, of course, typified um, in the Day of Atonement and uh, confirmed in the um, judgment that took place. Amen. So basically, as you've confirmed here, is that Christ is the key to the covenant. Obedience right. needs to be there. The promise is there. But Christ is the key. And the Bible says, interestingly, mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. That's why Ephesians 4.30, right. that's in First, I think it's in Corinthians 4.4, 4, First Corinthians 4.4, 4, that says the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. And to keep us until the day of salvation... And in Ephesians right. 4.30, it says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So he keeps us sealed until that day. So we need the Holy Spirit to keep us. And we have Christ as the key to the covenant. Now, God makes a covenant with Noah to protect his family members. He needs to obey. And then God does an amazing thing. He cleanses the earth through water. Brian, this is now a covenant made with Noah. This is before Abraham, where we really find the, you know, the official covenant. But God made a covenant with um, Noah, as it says in Genesis 6.18. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives and thee. Brian, how, how do we understand this covenant in relation to actually what we've already now looked at, at the basics of of a covenant agreement. So, so again, as you, you pointed out in the beginning that, that God is the initiator. I like this, the title to our study, um, that God is the primer. Mm. Uh, in other words, he alone um, guarantees that the covenant is established and guaranteed to take place. Uh, so we look at the covenant of Noah, for example, as we look at... Uh, this particular study, um, God gives a promise to Noah. And it's interesting, Renier, as you look at the promise that God gave to Noah, because prior to the flood, which is, of course, the promise he made with Noah, that they would be saved by their obedience, first of all, to build the ark, and they had to accept it by faith. Because at that point in time, there was nothing like rain that ever came from the sky. Um, Spirit of Prophet says God watered the plants with a fine mist. So, 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 so when God says he's going to destroy the earth with a flood, hmm. I mean, it was very clear to Noah that the, 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 the generation in his time was wicked and evil. Um, but, but it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord yes. in, in Genesis chapter 7. There. So uh, Genesis chapter 6. So the, which was to save Noah would only take place if Noah was obedient. He, he had to warn the world. And whilst he was warning the world for 120 years, it's a long time, Renier. When you think about that, I mean, hardly any human being today lives for 120 years. Of course, uh, Noah lives for, for centuries, hundreds of years. But the point is, he preached for 120 years. And when you think about, you know, <laughs> uh, as evangelists, you know, you, you, you want people to, to listen to heed and to respond to the message. Mm. Sadly, only his family <laughs> listened to his message. I mean, surely there were others that helped him build the ark, but, but in terms of their salvation, only his family. Uh, mm. And I mean, Noah could have been really discouraged preaching 120 years. I think about Jonah who preaches for a few days and the whole city, the king, his cabinet, they all convert and the guy is upset and wants to die. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand Jonah, but anyhow, yes. uh, when we look at uh, Noah, uh, Noah had to exercise faith in the covenant God made that it would rain. And, and even when he went into the ark, you know, for the first seven days, I mean, th those could have been really time of discouragement for Noah. For seven days, he's sealed in this ark with uh, smelly animals and, and there's jeering and taunting and uh, abuse coming from outside you crazy old man, you know, what you're doing there? You're going to die in there, you know. But the seventh day, the rain came and Noah was saved, him and his family. Isn't that a wonderful commitment? Amen. And God gave, uh, Renier, I, I got to read this here. It's a very short statement, speaking about the covenant that, that Jesus, uh, who's the creator, made with Noah. It's found in the book, Education 115, paragraph one. Because we know that God gave a rainbow 
um, as a sign of his covenant he made with Noah and his posterity, his descendants, that he would never again destroy the flood. Now, now, now listen to the language Ellen White says. It's a very short uh, passage. The rainbow spanning the heavens with its arc of light or arch of light is a token of the, here's the word, everlasting covenant between God and every creature. Sure. Find it in Genesis 9, 16. And the rainbow encircling the throne on high is also a token of God's, a token to God's children of his covenant of peace. Mm. And we see that evidently when Jesus ascends into the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, Revelation chapter 5, and the covenant of peace is established with mankind based on the fact that Jesus had sealed it with his blood. Mm. That's powerful. This, this whole story of, it's basically the plan of salvation. And that's, and that's what God does in every covenant that he establishes with people. It's the plan of salvation is the center of the covenant. It's the, the right. foundation of the covenants, the law of God. And the plan of salvation is the center. If you think of Genesis mm -hmm. 3.15, the first time the promise is given, it's in relation to Christ dying, the plan of salvation. If you think about this, um, right. the story of Noah, the, the covenant made here with Noah, you can say it's the first official covenant where God says, this is my covenant between you and me. Yes, the promise is in Genesis. Yes, the, the, the obedience needed to take place for them to stay in the garden, which was also a covenant. But the word covenant used basically the first time between God and a man is in Genesis chapter 6. And listen to what First Peter 3 verse 20. I always love this text when I talk about Noah's story or baptism mm. or anything like that. It, it says, formerly who, who, who were disobedient when once a divine noun suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark is being prepared and which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. So mm. God's goal was to protect Noah from sin. So the plan of salvation here is the water, it's not the ark. The ark just kept them alive, you know, the physical part, mm. but the spiritual part to be kept alive needed to be cleansed the world by water. And this is why God mm. then uses the plan of salvation to teach humanity right in the beginning. He hates sin and he has a remedy for sin. And yeah, as you say, Brian, mm. can you imagine preaching for 120, 120 years here comes the animals into the ark. So it's the time for the appeal. And you say, yeah. if you want to accept Christ, if you want to live, mm. come into the ark. Wherever is now, you know, and I can just imagine if it's a more modern day appeal, someone is there playing the piano softly, his wife playing the piano softly. And he says, come on, brothers. Right. You see the evidence. Here are the animals. They're coming in. Anyone who wants to come into the ark, now's the time. There's enough space. God loves you. No one responds. Not Come a on, he's preaching a person. No. <laughs> yeah. I can just imagine him sitting there. Okay, what, well, Lord, what do I need to say next? Yeah. People are not listening. Yeah. But the covenant promise. So, so, so Renee, it's interesting. Yes. Uh, immediately after the flood waters had subsided, the first thing Noah does when he comes out of the ark mm. is to render or offer a sacrifice unto God. Because again, we see uh, in Hebrews, uh, Paul says time and time again, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And of course, that pointed to uh, the greater sacrifice of Christ's blood, that yes. alone has power to forgive sin. Mm. So then it points to the sacrifice right after this major plan of salvation took place, the water covering the earth. He offers a sacrifice mm. pointing to the cross. Amazing, amazing. So then the covenant with Abraham. Now, this is probably the major one. You know, this is yeah. the old covenant established with the Israelites. And God gives him certain things when he says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, when he calls him to go to a land that he does not know. And God says, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. Your name will be great. You will be a blessing. Mm. And you will bless others, and the earth shall be blessed by this covenant. Mm. How do you understand this covenant, Brian? What is, is there even a difference, or are we seeing the same thing repeated over and over again? We're seeing the same thing repeated over again with, with greater emphasis. Mm. And, and, and we find that, um, and I counted the new seven things that God would do. God would make him, if he was obedient, 
and, and, and leave Ur of the Chaldeans, which was, of course, a wicked land, um, and make his way to the promised land that he didn't know of. So by faith, he had to, again, trust in God's promise. But God would make him a great nation. God would bless him. God would make this, his name great. God would make him a blessing. God would bless those who blessed him and curse those who cursed him. And God would, through him, bless all the families of the earth. So, so we're talking here of a total generation. It's interesting, you know, when Noah goes into the ark, there's only really one nation that speak one language, you know, uh, until after the flood. Yes. Then we find the Tower of Babel and the rebellion that comes up. So, so, so wickedness begins to increase on the face of the earth again after God's cleansed the earth. And so God establishes his covenant now with Abraham now. And of course, it, 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 it comes closer home to Christ because we find Abraham and his wife could not bear children. Well, at least Abraham could, but his wife, Sarah, couldn't. And mm -hmm. the covenant was with Isaac, not with Ishmael. Yes. And, and, and so we see now it comes close home. Take thine son, thine only son, and offer him where? On Mount Moriah, mm -hmm. where God's only son, through the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, would be offered finally. So we see we, we're getting closer and closer. And, and again, God saying, all the nations of the earth. So, so, of course, by the time when Jesus comes, there are all these different nations, and there are 10 of them mentioned in the book of uh, Exodus. 10 of them that God uh, displaces to make way for Israel. His mm. covenant is with Israel, uh, a prince with God. Jacob, of course, who comes from Isaac, who comes from Abram. So we're just getting closer and closer home. And, of course, Abram is the father of faith. I mean, the test on Mount Moriah was just so eloquently and emphatically pointing toward Christ, his mm. only son. Because again, we see Abram doesn't slay his son, but what happens? Mm. God provides. Now, Abram says it by faith when he's climbing up the mountain. He doesn't know how God's going to do it to Isaac. Isaac says, my father, we've got the wood. We've got the matches. Where's the sacrifice? Yes. God himself will provide a sacrifice. And God does provide a sacrifice. Abram's son is not sacrificed, but rather there's a ram that is caught there. And God says, offer that because that points to my son. He finally will be on this very same spot, Mount Moriah. He will be sacrificed for the sins of all the nations. I mean, it's so, so beautiful in here. It is. So clearly, again, we see the plan of salvation playing out in the life of Abraham. And the part that really mm. stands out for me is the fact that all the earth will be blessed because of this covenant with one man that is obedient to the will of God and walks in his will. Now, that is an amazing thing. Now, it didn't necessarily happen right. in his lifetime because Isaac came then Jacob and Esau, and then the 12 sons. And so it spread throughout the earth. Abraham had his influence mm -hmm. on the people that he came in contact with. Um, and those were many, you know, Sodom's king, um, Lot, Melchizedek, etc. So Abraham had his impact on the people around him. But God is saying to us that when we walk in obedience to him, when we follow the rules of his covenant that he has made with us, the impact will be way larger, way greater than what we can ever imagine nor see within this lifetime. Now, hopefully mm. Jesus comes in our lifetime, and that's what I am hope for. And I, the signs of the times does show that it should be in our lifetime. But let's say the world were to go on. Or, or what about the people that lived before us? You know, that blessing is still continuing right up to our day. And mm. we... We don't always understand what God has in store for us as his people um, in this world. If we just walk in, his, in obedience to his will, if we yeah. do what he says, if we, we bring everything to him, doesn't mean Abraham didn't make mistakes. Abraham lied about his wife twice. It was, you know, half a lie, but there was still deception in it. He did it twice. He still took Hagar. He still, um, um, what was the other thing that he did? Yeah, he took Hagar. He lied about his wife. So he made mistakes. But God still blessed him abundantly because he's got a heart to do the will of God and to walk in his covenant. Then God makes a covenant with Moses. Basically, 
establishing the covenant that he made with Abraham. After 430 years in Egyptian bondage, God now makes a covenant with Moses. We can read it in Exodus 6. I'm going to read verses 3, 4, and 8. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, mm. but by my name, Lord, I was known to them. I've also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of the pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And then verse 8, And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage and the Lord. Mm. So here God continues with the promise he gave to Abraham. Now, some people may argue and say, you know, what a type of God is this that you worship that takes so long to fulfill the promise that he gave? But what we need to understand is God's covenant promise has a larger goal in mind than just temporal right. benefits. For like for Abraham, he still blessed him abundantly. And he did keep to what he said. It will come from your seed. And Isaac came. That was the major thing for Abraham. And Abraham did dwell mm -hmm. in Canaan, but he did not experience the full prosperity that Israel did when they went into the promised land after 400 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, and then only did they experience the full blessing of the promised land. So it's almost, Brian, like God's covenant and promise has like this line of blessings that's not necessarily all fulfilled in your lifetime, but the blessings that you do mm -hmm. receive keeps to the promises that he has given. Now, how do you understand this, this promise, this covenant that he made with Moses in relation to Abraham, etc.? So, so again, you, we, we see the link uh, in all the covenants going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, because mm. you find here, God again says, I will, uh, I will take care of this year. And, and, and Abram had to believe God. And I love there in Genesis 15 verses 6, it says, He believed the Lord and he, that's the Lord, counted it, his faith mm. for righteousness, Abram's faith. So, so isn't this a, I mean, you just pointed out a couple of mistakes that Abram made in his life, um, trying to help God out by taking Hagar and producing um, Ishmael. And that caused so much problems for Ishmael, I mean, I mean, for Isaac and his descendants. Um, and we find the very nations that uh, needed to be removed were the ones that caused problems for him later on. The point is, Renir, as we, as we look at God referring Moses back to the covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and of course with Jacob, we find here God says, listen, I realize that this is going to take place. I realize that they're going to go into Egypt. But they will come out and with much substance. I realize they're going to rebel with me even on the way to the promised land. I mean, they spent 40 years that they did not need to spend in the wilderness. It was all because of their unbelief. And Paul later on corroborates that in Hebrews chapter 4. He says they did not enter in, that's the covenant that God made with them in the promised land because of unbelief. Only Caleb and Joshua, you know, in that rebellion that happened there on the borders of Canaan. Um, they were the only ones that entered in that were under the ages of 21. The point is, Renil, God promises, and I love the promise. He says, I will redeem you with my stretched arm. Mm -hmm. When you think about that, Jesus' arms were stretched out on the cross. And we are, uh, Paul, I mean, Peter says it very clearly. Um, I think it's First Peter chapter 3, 16. He says, we are not redeemed with, silver or gold or any corruptible thing, but with the precious blood as that of a lamb. So God says, listen here, though they were strangers, I'll call them out. Though they will rebel against me, I will judge that nation Egypt. And I will remember my covenant with them and bring them out. So God pointing back to the promise he made. He made an oath that he would take care of his part of the covenant. What was the problem with Israel? They did not. And even when at the Mount Sinai, they said, all the Lord will do, as said, we will do. They failed. And Jeremiah says, the covenant which they broke. Yes. Sad, sad re repetition of rebellion, sin, and um, God still saying, listen, I'll come through for you. 
I'll be your God and I'll remember your sin no more. If you are willing and obedient. As you have said, and you pointed back to Genesis 3.15, if you think about how God set free Israel from Egyptian slavery on their mm. way to go to the promised land, promise given to Abraham when the covenant was made, um, how did God do that? What was the final plague? Mm. You know, what, what did the Israelites have to do? That to slay the Passover lamb. And in Corinthians, yeah. it says to us that Christ is our Passover. So once again, Amen. it points to the plan of salvation. It has everything right. to do with the Messiah that is going to come while you are receiving um, current blessings. There is a bl greater blessing in the future, and that is the Messiah that will set us free from sin. Amen. It's also interesting to note that the lamb had to die first before the Egyptians firstborn died. Right. God first would sacrifice his own son before he dishes out the punishment where you lose yours. Isn't that a mm. merciful God? After Amen. nine plagues, you know, if it was Jonah, <laughs> Jonah just said, Israel, don't worry about slaying a lamb. I'm just going to kill these people and wipe them out. Yeah, for sure. But that's not how God saw it. He first mm. would sacrifice himself before he goes and destroys the wicked. God has a great promise for all of us. And that promise is in Christ Jesus, kept by the Holy Spirit until the day of salvation. And that is that he would change our hearts, our mind for the coming of Christ, so that we can live in our heavenly promised land for eternity. Mm -hmm. I love Exodus 6, 8. It says, and I will bring you into the land which I saw to Abraham. Sorry, not 8, verse, eight, verse 7. I will take you as my people. And I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burden, burdens of the Egyptians. I am the God that brings you under, out from under the burdens of sin. I will set you free. You will be my people. What a promise. What a covenant. Man, this covenant thing, you know, we can say so much. Um, but I know we're only skimming the surface. The lesson said that we're going to go deeper as we continue. And now, so, Ramir, as, yes, Brian. As you, as you, uh, just before we go on the next segment, uh, as you think about the covenant God makes with Israel there on Mount Sinai through his servant Moses, and God writes it down on tables of stone, uh, before the covenant is actually read out, uh, which we usually go into the first commandment that says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But mm -hmm. just before that, the basis on which that covenant is given, he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. Mm. Therefore, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Mm. And so when we think of uh, Egypt, Egypt, of course, is a symbol of sin in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Egypt is mentioned there. We see it in the book of Daniel, chapter 11. This Egypt, this uh, atheistic unbelief of the nations that have rebelled against God is symbolized by Egypt because Pharaoh says, who is the Lord Jehovah that I should let him go? And he says, I don't know him. And here God is saying, listen, I know my people. And he says, you will be called by my name and I will be a God to you and you shall be my people. So we see the relationship now that God wants to have with his people. God is coming up close and we find that, of course, uh, later on our study there in um, John 17 verses 3. I'm not going to jump to that now. But the point is God wants to build a relationship with the people in the heart of the covenant. The fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 verses 11 onwards speaks of, or 8 to 11 rather, speaks of God wanting to have this relationship with these people. Mm. He says, I am the Lord thy God. First of all, I'm your creator. I made you. Six days you'll labor and do all your work, but the seven days of Sabbath, the Lord, I want to spend time with you. And so to, to, to develop this trust relationship with God is only as we spend time with him in his word. And then we find that he becomes our God just as verily as we are his children. Amen. The new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Let's mm. read that. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Mm. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and I'll write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wow. Now, what I understand from this new covenant promise and the foundation being the law of God of obedience is that God is saying, as he said to Israelites, you will be my people. So that is still, you know, one of the benefits. Then right. he wants to change our characters or sanctify our characters. Let me put it that way. You're still you, but he wants to sanctify our characters for the kingdom. And then we receive the kingdom when Jesus mm -hmm. comes. That's the new covenant in basic, basic layman terms. Brian, how do you understand the, the new covenant? So, so I've just turned here. It's, it's not our study. I know it'll come up in another study for sure. Um, but, but Paul now looking back to the covenant made with uh, Abraham uh, and even back to Genesis 3.15, he says now in Hebrews 8 verses 8, for finding fault with them, mm. that is with Israel, who failed to live up to the covenant promises. God carried out his end. He delivered them from Egypt. He brought them to Canaan. But we see rebellion after rebellion. And he said, listen, when you go there, I want you to teach your children and let that be as frontlets upon their foreheads. In other words, the mind, uh, teach them the words of this covenant. Of course, God's 10 commandments. Uh, he says, so, so he says, uh, behold, the days come to the Lord. And now Paul is quoting verbatim what you've just read there in Jeremiah mm. 31, 33 onwards there, right? Um, and, and, and he says here, um, for I will be merciful to the unrighteousness um, at the end, right? And the sins and the iniquities, I will remember no more. In that, he said, God says this year, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and wax old is ready to vanish away. So what was the problem with the, the old covenant? The covenant itself was not the problem. It was the basis of which the people were to respond. And they failed completely. And we find, of course, the, in, in, the covenant itself was ratified with the blood of bulls and goats mm. and, and animals. And God says, listen, that one will not do. Um, he, he taketh it away and he findeth what? A better covenant. What is this better covenant? In Hebrews chapter 10, he says, wherefore, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Wherefore he cometh, this is Jesus now, and he says, listen here, by his blood he taketh away the first and established the second. Uh, and I know we'll, we'll go into it in detail, mm. but, but the point is the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That is not without the shedding of blood that sin could be done away with. And of course we found that in the old covenant, uh, through the sacrificial systems, mm. uh, the blood of bulls and goats and rams and pigeons and doves all pointed forward to the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. I know mm. we'll go in depth for that, but yes. isn't that so beautiful, Rene, as we look at and, and to our viewers? We can look back by faith and know mm. that Christ has paid the price for my sins and that through his high priestly ministry, in the heavenly sanctuary, my sins can be blotted out, Amen. cleansed by the blood of Christ. I mean, this is just so beautiful. That's the new covenant, my friends. God wants to blot out our sins. He wants to sanctify us so that we can spend eternity in the heavenly promised land like the Israelites mm. spent in the earthly promised land. In the old Amen. covenant, God had to wipe out the old people and just take the young people through for them to live a life in the promised land where their sins are remembered no more. Yet they failed mm. after that too. May we not fail and stay obedient to God. We should yes. base this, this law written in our minds and our hearts is not based upon our personal feelings, our personal tests or opinions. Mm -mm. But it's rather based upon what Christ has done 
and what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us to keep us until that day. So as, right. as I've said in the beginning, this is just an overview. I know the lesson said we're going to go much deeper. So I'm excited about it. You know, it's just fascinating to study the covenant. Brian, thank you for this time that you spent with us. To our viewers, we see you again next time. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. And may God richly bless you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity we had to, to study this lesson. And I pray that you would help us to stay obedient to you and that we would Amen. always keep the plan of salvation in mind when we think of the covenants, that it was Christ's Amen. death that ratified his blood, that ratified the covenant, and that we Amen. can stand in front of you without spot because Christ can forgive us. Thank you Amen. for this amazing plan of salvation that you've put in place. Bless us until next time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.